This is a review of the basics of functional tonal harmony. Tonal harmony is what we call harmony in which there is a single most stable note called the tonic, and in which all of the other notes and chords are defined by their relationship to that tonic. It forms the basis of most classical, jazz, popular, and at least the European derived forms of folk music. But the specifics of exactly how tonal harmony operates in these styles varies quite a bit. Functional harmony is what we call music in which all of the chords seem to have a clear job or definable role in the music. So to start with, let's look at the major scale. Um, here we can see a major scale. It's got seven notes, uh, which leaves five notes out of the possible 12 outside of the scale. That's very important. We can see that it has five whole steps between the first scale degree and the second, the second and the third, the fourth and the fifth, the fifth and the sixth, and the sixth and the seventh. And that it also has two half steps between the third and fourth and the seven and eight. This pattern of half steps and whole steps, especially the location of the half steps, is very important and determines a lot about what makes tonal harmony work. The basic concept here is that the notes in the scale aren't all the same. They have different characters depending on their relationship to the tonic. Tonic is the first note. So some stars are going to sound very stable and solid, which we call consonants, and some are going to sound unstable and tense, again, in relation to the tonic, and we call that dissonance. Why this is true has something to do with what we call psychoacoustics, which is how the brain processes sound. Musical notes are unusual in the world of sound in that they produce simple, stable frequencies, as opposed to almost all other sounds, which we call noise, which produce chaotic masses of frequencies with no single predominating one. When we relate to musical notes, the simpler the ratio between their fundamental frequencies, the more consonant we say they are. And then conversely, the more complex the ratios, the more dissonant. Basically, the more work our brain has to do to process the two notes together, the more unhappy it is. And then we experience that by feeling uh, tense and that the sound needs, in quotes, to be resolved to simpler and uh, an easier set of ratio between frequencies. For example, the octave is the simplest possible ratio, two to one, meaning that the upper note in the octave vibrates against your ear, your ear drum, exactly twice as often as the lower one. It is so consonant in that regards that we hear it as just another version of the same note, just higher. The next most consonant interval is the perfect fifth, and it has a ratio of two to three. Um, the major seventh, on the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, it has a ratio of closer to 15 to eight. Uh, so it presents quite a bit of work for our poor brain. So, since we are always relating pitches in the major scale to the tonic, their relative degrees of complexity in their ratio, and therefore their dissonance, or consonance, gives them all a distinctive flavor that affects the way they behave in music. The consonance and dissonance between scale degrees, that is not just related to the tonic, but next to each other, is also important. And this is where the half steps become such a big factor. The ratio between a note and another note a whole step away is around nine to eight, which is a bit dissonant, but not too terribly bad. But the ratio between two notes a half step apart is more like 16 to 15, which is the most complex ratio and therefore dissonant relationship we have, which you'll know if you've ever played or sang a note a half step wrong in a performance. So let's put some of this together. We have a scale built on a single tone, which we call a tonic, and it has a range of other tones with varying degrees of consonance or dissonance in relation to the tonic. So if we go through the pitches of the scale over a nice drone on the tonic, their characteristics become clear. Basically, if it seems as though the note is stable and can just 
coexist with the tonic of the scale, it's consonant. If it seems like it wants to move, then it's dissonant. All right, so we start off. Obviously, the tonic is fine. The second scale degree. You notice it doesn't sound quite at rest. And if you sort of project forward, that move from two to one feels like a tension and then a resolution. The third scale degree, nice and sweet, doesn't really seem to move anywhere, so constant. The fourth scale degree, not so constant, right? There's a kind of a tension there, a rub against where we think it should be, which is this, four to three. Tension, resolution. The fifth, totally fine. Couldn't be more constant. The sixth, again, kind of like the second, seems like it kind of wants to fall down to the five. Tension, resolution. The seventh, well, pretty sharply distant, right? In fact, almost every neuron in our brain is saying, please resolve. So those tendencies within the scale degrees to feel like they want to move or to feel like they're at rest is a really big deal. All right, so we can see from that that we have three stable tones, the one, three, and five, two unstable tones, the two and the six, and two very unstable tones, the four and the seven. The high degree of dissonance in the fourth and seventh scale degree is because they are half steps away, remember that very dissonant interval, half steps away from consonant tones. And at least in the case of the seventh, it is also a dissonant interval in relation to the tonic, right? So we have both kinds of dissonance, that is, in relation to the tonic and in relation to the scale degrees, right? So this is the strongest possible dissonance in the major scale, which is why it was given its special name of leading tone. When we build the other chords in the key, therefore, they will be made up of the tendencies of stability or instability that are inherent in the notes they contain. And those qualities determine what we call their function. If we examine the other two major chords in the scale, the four and the five, we see that they each have one stable tone, one unstable tone, and one very unstable tone. This means that they both have a tendency to need to resolve to the one, but of the two, the five is more unstable since it has the most unstable note, the seventh scale degree. Plus which, if we make the five a five seven chord, which is very, very common, we see that it will have both of the half step dissonances and will therefore generate the strongest possible resolution to the tonic that we can have without introducing notes from outside the scale into the mix. Most tonal harmony, then, is a succession of moves between stability uh, towards varying degrees of instability, and then back again to stability. These three functions, which we call tonic function, that's stability, the subdominant function, that's instability, and the dominant function, strong instability, are the basic building blocks of music. But it doesn't just refer to the three major chords, although we're used to thinking of them as just the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant. Right? Those are the names of the chords, but they're also the names of this more abstract concept of function. Okay? The other chords in the key, then, can be assigned to one of those functions, depending on how many notes it shares with one of those three chords. So, we can see that the six and the three chord both share two pitches with the one chord.
So we assign them tonic function, meaning that they are more stable than they are unstable. Although the three chord is a bit odd, since it also has the leading tone in it, for this reason it's really not often as used as the six. The two chord shares two pitches with the four chord and is assigned subdominant function. And the seven chord shares two pitches with the five and is assigned dominant function. So all of the chords that we can make in a major scale are assigned to one of these three possible functions, stability, instability, high instability. In the most basic possible terms, and there are always many, many exceptions, even in simple music, tonic chords will happen throughout a piece, whenever there is a pause or a rest or an ending. Dominant chords nearly always move to tonic chords. And subdominant chords usually, but not always, move to dominant chords. We can think of all this as being kind of like basic grammar uh, in a sentence. So there's lots and lots of variations that are possible within language, but they're all within a pretty limited set of jobs that words can do, like be a subject or an object or a verb or an adjective, etc. Okay, so let's look at a few short musical examples. The first one is an old folk song called Go Tell Aunt Rudy, and it's about as simple as it can be. can see that it's built around a simple alternation between tonic functions and dominant function. If we look at the melody, it spells it out very plainly. The tune sticks mostly to chord tones, with an occasional non-chord tone always on the offbeat. The melody also includes the seventh on the five chord to reinforce its dominant function. Let's listen again, and I will change the sound of the notes to fit their function. Okay, all consonant notes, the one, three, and five, will have their regular piano sound and all the dissonant notes, the two, the four, and the seven, in this case, there's no six, uh, will have a string sound in it to differentiate it. And then when those tones resolve to the consonant tones, I'll put a little bell sound in it so you can hear the notes that the dissonances resolve to. The point here is to differentiate the sounds of the functions within the music. This may seem really simple, but a lot of much more complex music operates on a very similar framework and then simply elaborates or extends these same basic functional harmonies. The next example is from Bach Chorale. I have left the figured bass numbers out of the Roman numeral analysis to focus just on the basic functions of the harmony. Here we see pretty clearly how music can move through its various functions even in a very short span of time. We can see how Bach uses the sixth chord as a weaker tonic function chord in the second measure. Uh, we can see also that the subdominant chords move both to the tonic or to the dominant chords. And we can see the incorporation of the 5 7 sound as an intensifier of moving into cadences in measure 2 and 4. Okay, let's listen again, and this time imagine that we have some sort of harmonic instability sensor that will display the amount of tension or stability in music. The meter is going to have five levels. Stable tonic functions, that'll be the one chord. Less stable tonic functions, that's either the three or the six. Instability, be the subdominant functions. High instability, dominant function. And very high instability, that would be dominant functions with both half-step tendency tones, meaning usually the 5-7 chord. So 
So if we put all of that together in the music, it looks like this. So let's listen again and see if you can match up the representation of stability and instability with the music that you're hearing. The most important point in all of this is to remember that all functional tonal music has this kind of underlying structure of tension and resolution, and that that gives music a sense that it is moving forward and going places, and telling a kind of story over time, which is a big part of its meaning and of its emotional impact on us. <laughs> 